Turn to mute. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for the Insulin Connection. I'm hopeful and that the information that um, I'll share with you today will will make an impact. And if it prompts further questions, we've um, added some time at the end for questions. And of course, Mary is a wealth of information, so you can direct those to her as well. And she can also give you my contact information if you have any specific questions that you want to address after the presentation. So my name is Lisa Lineberg and I'm with Be Better Health, um, your wellness, one of your wellness providers. And I'm actually based in Charleston, West Virginia. So if you're getting a little bit of an accent, uh, that's why. I try to disguise it as best I can. So without further ado, we'll get started. So let's just see what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about insulin's diverse role in our body, um, eating to control blood sugar, the effects of sleep and stress on blood sugar, which sometimes we tend to just look at the food aspect. And then we're also going to be talking about exercising to help improve our insulin sensitivity. So we're going to start now um, with a little bit of science at the beginning of this presentation. So hopefully, we all say that knowledge is power, so hopefully this will give you some knowledge about insulin. So what is insulin? When you think of insulin, usually an image of someone giving themselves an insulin injection comes to mind. So we tend to think of someone who has been diagnosed with diabetes. So most people do associate insulin with diabetes. So if you are not diabetic, you probably don't think that insulin has anything to do with you. But um, insulin is the primary hormone that drives all of our metabolism, and it influences the actions of almost every cell in our body. So it's pretty important. It's made in the pancreas, and it's a major nutrient storage hormone. So it, it definitely does a lot. The primary job of insulin, insulin has other jobs than this, but what, what we're really going to be focusing on today is the primary job of insulin is to keep our blood sugar from going too high. So it drives the sugar into our cells, it helps reduce the sugar in our blood, and it binds to what we call insulin receptors on our muscle cells. And we're going to explain this in a little bit more detail, so hopefully it will make more sense to you. So we have uh, muscle cells, liver cells, all kinds of cells in our body, but the, we're going to talk about our muscle and liver, liver cells. On those cells, we have what's called insulin receptors. All of our cells have those, and we have to have these receptors. They, they, they have a specific function. So these insulin receptors, if we look at our cell here, they are proteins that reside on our cell surface that bind to the insulin and move the sugar from the blood into our muscle cells for storage. So let's, let's think about this for just a minute. We eat something that has sugar in it or turns to sugar in our body, and we'll talk about that in more detail as well. That sugar is converted um, into glucose, into our blood, and then that, that glucose, the sugar, has to move into our cells for storage. So these insulin receptors are tiny little sugar pumps that are turned on by insulin. So without insulin, the receptors are not going to work, and the sugar will accumulate in our blood. So there's several insulin conditions. The first one is called hyperinsulinemia which is too much insulin in the blood. So hyper means excessive or above normal. Another condition we call insulin resistance. So at that point, the insulin receptors that we just talked about, they require more than the normal amount of insulin to make them work. The next condition that we'll talk about is type 2 diabetes. And at that point, our pancreas can no longer secrete enough insulin. And as you may be aware when you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, then you're probably going to have to take some form of medication or an injection of insulin to help bring that blood sugar down. 
The other condition we call insulin sensitivity. So, so it's the opposite of insulin resistance. Uh, the receptors require very little insulin to make them work, and that is a desired condition. And if you look there at the bottom, elevated insulin levels precede the actual development of type 2 diabetes by as much as 5 to 10 years. And that's, a, that's an important statement to note. Mary and I were just discussing this before the presentation, that when we have elevated levels, and we're in what we call that moderate risk range, at that point we have a choice to go either way. If we continue to have the same habits, um, then we can develop type 2 diabetes, or we can make a few changes and hopefully go in the other direction and go into the low risk category and hopefully get to this desired condition, which we call insulin sensitivity. So we were talking about blood sugar, and if you think about um, when you have your health screening done, which is coming up soon, they do test your blood sugar, and that's exactly what it means, sugar in your blood. Let's so just, if we're going to make it seem very simple, but your muscle and your liver cells can only store a minimum amount of glycogen. Glycogen is simply the stored form of glucose. So we talk about blood sugar, glycogen, and glucose. We're, we're essentially talking about the same thing. It just becomes, um, it gets converted into different forms once we digest our food. So our muscle and liver cells can only store so much glycogen. And any of that glucose that's still in the bloodstream that didn't get converted, it gets converted into triglycerides. So the blood sugar goes one of two ways. It either goes into your cells or it remains in the bloodstream and gets converted into what's called triglycerides. And then your fat cells receive the signal to hold on to the fat and not release it for energy. So simply put, eating too much sugar or too many things that convert to sugar in your body will result in higher triglycerides. Those insulin receptors that we talked about before, they become desensitized to insulin storage signals, and the result is insulin resistance that we talked about. And what's worse is if you are sedentary, then you have plenty of stored glycogen in your cells. We talked about that blood sugar moving into your cells, the stored form is called glycogen. What happens when that is in your cells, your body can take that take that glycogen and use it for energy. So if you're exercising, you can move that glycogen out of your cells. But if you're sedentary, that's going to tend to sit there in your cells and eventually you're going to store more fat. The insulin will eventually just take the carbs and the fat straight to your fat cells and you become resistant to further storage. So hopefully this all makes sense. I realize that was a lot of terms to digest, but if you can absorb the, the overall concept, when you think about if I'm sedentary or if I'm active as one component of this, what would the solution be? Exercise incessantly or change your diet, because we do want to move that blood sugar, that glycogen out of our cells. All right, so let's let's go to um, food and how food affects our blood sugar. So I like to call these foods the white devils, foods that raise blood sugar. Sugar, bread, pasta, potatoes, and those cause your blood sugar to rise out of what we call its comfort zone. And just remember when that blood sugar rises, the first thing that has to happen is your pancreas has to release insulin to reduce that blood sugar. Now, there are other foods that raise our blood sugar, too. Fruit, milk, anything with white or wheat flour, and I'm not saying that those, all those things are bad, but just in the context of raising your blood sugar, and we're going to talk about how we combine foods to help with this. So just to give you an idea of the proper blood sugar levels, if you remember having blood work done at your health screen that we talked about, and it's coming up, they'll do a blood glucose test. 
We look for a healthy fasting blood sugar of less than 100. And anything over 100 for a fasting blood sugar is considered moderate risk. So when you eat the white devils, it causes your blood sugar to skyrocket. And then your pancreas has to release a high amount of insulin once. As we delve into food a little deeper, we have what's called the three food, what we call macronutrients. And those are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So to remember what each of those are, for carbohydrates, as we put, that would be anything that grows in the ground. So think about what grows in the ground. Fruit, vegetables, wheat, sugar, those are carbohydrates. Fats would be oils, nuts, seeds, avocados. And think of uh, fats or fats are um, foods, they make your foods taste better. The oils, um, mayonnaise, things like that. And then protein, a simple way to remember that is anything with a face. So think of things like chicken, turkey, fish, beef, pork, and eggs. So if you are looking at a food, so not an obvious food like a piece of steak or a piece of chicken, uh, and you're wondering how to classify that food, what you do is determine uh, what macronutrient it is highest in. So just look at the label. So let's take peanut butter, for example. A serving of peanut butter has 7 grams of protein, 8 grams of carbohydrate, and 16 grams of fat. So for classification purposes, we would consider peanut butter a fat. Another example would be black beans. A half cup serving of black beans has half a gram of fat, 19 grams of carbohydrate, and seven grams of protein. So black beans would be classified as a carbohydrate. And I mentioned those two foods um, just because if we're looking at getting protein from beans, beans definitely have protein, but you also have to remember that they also contain a lot of carbohydrates. So I always tell people, you know, be a food investigator. Don't rely on the marketing on the package. Turn those Turn the label, turn the package around and look at the ingredients. And that's going to really tell you what's in your food and then look at the nutrition label to find out what's exactly in there. So there was a test done called the gastric emptying time test. And what they did with this test is they took the three macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fat, and they wanted to see how quickly those foods um, leave your stomach. They also wanted to see once that happened, what was the effect on the blood sugar. So they took carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. They took each one separately. So for example, a carbohydrate, uh, let's just say, would be a piece of bread by itself, nothing else with it. So no butter on it, no jelly, not a part of a sandwich. Um, for protein, they took meats by themselves, nothing with that. And for fat, they just took fat by themselves. So that could have been something like, you know, some olive oil or coconut oil. And what they found was with carbohydrates, they empty from our stomach within one hour. Protein emptied from the stomach was around two to three hours. And fat, it took three to five hours for the stomach to be completely emptied of fat. So what does this mean for us? This is pretty significant because the carbs left the uh, stomach quickly um, and they saw a quicker blood sugar rise and the body had to release a lot of insulin at once and then the blood sugar would drop quickly. So let's look at this uh, in a graph so it might make a little bit more sense. So the green dotted line is carbohydrates. The blue dotted line is protein, and the red is fat. And this is, along the bottom, this is hours after eating. Okay, so that's zero to six there. Okay, so the carbohydrates, this is the emptied in the stomach quickly, and this is the blood sugar level. So they ate something, carbohydrates alone, so anything like bread, rice, cereal, pasta, milk, sugar, and if you look there, rise and the fall, quick.
quickly. So protein, meat, fish, cheese, look how much how much longer it took those to empty from the stomach, okay? And the blood sugar level didn't rise quickly at all, okay? And then the fat, there was hardly any effect on blood sugar. Just a slight rise and a slight fall. So if you look at this line here on the carbohydrates, look how quickly the blood sugar fell. So when that blood sugar gets really low, um, if you've heard of the term hangry before, that's a, I don't even know if that's in the dictionary, but the term hangry, a combination of hunger and angry. So think about when you just get really, really hungry and your blood sugar has fallen. And what happens is if we continue to just eat carbohydrates, we get this blood sugar rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall. And if we recall from the beginning of our presentation, Every time uh, you know, our blood sugar rises, our pancreas has to release insulin to bring that blood sugar down. So if we're eating those carbohydrates like that and we get that rise and fall, we're really going to start overworking our pancreas to release insulin, and then we can become what's called insulin resistant, where we talked about before. So I really like this illustration here because it really puts it into perspective. So what can we do to to help this. So one of the things that we can do is make sure that when we're eating that we combine, that we don't eat these carbohydrates alone, and that we combine them with other um, macronutrients like proteins and fats so that our blood sugar doesn't have that rise and fall quickly over the course of the day. So combine protein and fat with carbohydrates. That way you have a longer gastric emptying time and you have a slow controlled increase and a slow controlled decrease in blood sugar. You don't get hungry as quickly and that will lessen your sweet craving. So when you get that rise and fall in your, in your blood sugar, you find that you need something quickly to eat because you're so hungry. And that's when we typically make a poor food choice because we want to find something that's readily available, easy to eat. So if we have that blood sugar fall, we walk through the door after a day at work, we're, we're way too hungry to wait on ourselves to fix dinner. Or while we're fixing dinner, we're going to go ahead and grab something out of the pantry that we can easily get out of a box or a bag or a wrapper to satisfy those cravings because our blood sugar is so low. So after learning all this, one rule would be to never eat carbohydrates alone. Combine those with a protein or fat every time you eat to temper those blood glucose swings and control our appetites and our cravings. So let's, let's look at some examples of some food combinations um, to see what would have the best effect. OK. So which is better for breakfast? So option one would be a two-egg omelet with bacon scrambled in a half a tablespoon of butter with three-quarters of a cup of fresh berries. Or option two is one serving of whole grain cereal with skim milk and six ounces of orange juice. So if you were just looking at these two options, most people are immediately going to go to option two. I see whole grains in there. I see milk. I see orange juice. And not that these things aren't healthy, but if you look at when we combine those things together, all three of those are carbohydrates. So the cereal is a carbohydrate, skim milk is a carbohydrate, and orange juice is a carbohydrate. So if we think back to our gastric emptying time, all these foods, there's, there's nothing to slow down the blood sugar rise and fall in this, except for the fact that the whole grain cereal probably has a little bit of fiber in it, which does slow that down. But in this top example, we have some carbohydrates in our fresh berries, or that could even be a piece of toast there. Um, but then we also have protein in our uh, with two eggs and some fat in here as well. So when we're looking at blood sugar control, this option one would be the better option. I sort of gave it away with this uh, 
type in the name with the thumbs up there. Let's look at another one. So let's think about lunch and dinner. So option one, I've got a chicken breast sautéed in some olive oil with some cooked vegetables, and then a small sweet potato topped with a little bit of butter and cinnamon. Or option two is one cup of whole wheat pasta topped with tomato sauce and breadsticks. And option two, our pasta is a carbohydrate, the tomato sauce is a carbohydrate, the breadsticks are a carbohydrate. And in option one, we have a good mix of protein, carbohydrates in the vegetables and potato, and we have fat, a little bit of fat in the olive oil and the butter. So does this mean that you can never have pasta? Absolutely not. But the point is here to make it the side of your meal instead of the star. So if you wanted to have some pasta with your meal, you could have your chicken breast with, you know, half a cup of whole wheat pasta on the side. So if you look at the foods, just look at how you're combining your foods and just make sure that you're having all of those three macronutrients in there. Okay, so the last example I'll put here is what's going to be better to grab and go? So there are a couple options here. One is a banana with vitamin water. Option two is a cheese stick and an apple. And option three is a handful of almonds and a pear. So we look at each option. A banana, oh gosh, bananas are great. They have a lot of you know, vitamins and minerals and nutrients in them. Um, but a banana is a carbohydrate. And depending on the size of the banana, you can get as much as 30 you know, at least 30 grams of sugar in one banana, or 30 grams of carbohydrate. Now, that is fruit sugar. And a vitamin water, um, although that would appear to be healthy, a regular vitamin water has a lot of sugar in it as well. So that first option is all carbohydrate. Option two is a cheese stick with an apple. The cheese stick has about nine grams of protein in it, and then, of course, an apple, depending on the size. Um, and have various amount of carbohydrates. And the cheese stick also has some fat in it as well. The third option is almonds. Almonds are a good source of fat. They have a little bit of protein in there and some carbohydrates. And of course, a pair of carbohydrates. So in this example, option two would probably be the number one choice. Option three, the number two choice. And then option one, would, you definitely would want to stay away from that. So if you want to have a banana, what I suggest to people is if you're going to have that as a snack, have something with it. You could have, you could cut that banana in half and have half the banana. So that, that would cut down on the number of carbohydrates and the sugars in there. And you could combine that with a cheese stick or, you know, some sliced deli meat. So there's lots of options there. So just be really aware of uh, your food combinations. Okay, I wanted to point this out. There was a study in 2003 um, on type 2 uh, diabetics, a cinnamon study, and the participants in this study were given one, three, or six grams of cinnamon daily for 40 days. And after those 40 days, before and after this, this study, they tested, uh, measured their fasting glucose and their triglycerides. And after those 40 days, uh, their fasting glucose reduced 20% and their triglycerides reduced 25%. And the couple of interesting things about this study is that it did not matter which amount of cinnamon they were given, all three groups um, had these results. So they you know, basically determined from this, and there's multiple studies out there, you can, you can Google those and check them out uh, if you put in cinnamon study. Um, is the effect on blood sugar. So you know, if you are if you can add cinnamon to your diet, that's great. So if you find that you do have higher blood sugar or if you have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, another way to help reduce that, that blood sugar is uh, with cinnamon. That tastes great. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about the effect of stress and sleep on blood sugar. Because when we talk about blood sugar, obviously we, we almost always think about foods effects on blood sugar, 
but we tend to not think of other factors in our life that can affect, affect our blood sugar. Cortisol is a stress hormone, and you've probably heard about cortisol. Um, we do need it, and it works with other hormones uh, to regulate our energy levels. And if you look at the graph there, cortisol is typically high in the morning and low at night. So you can see there, and this should be the, net, the normal, normal, excuse me, cortisol level. So unfortunately, we can release cortisol um, when we are in stressful situations. So we have two types of stress. We have acute stress, and that would be known as, you could also know, um, call that the fight or flight response. So some examples would be if you had a job interview or you're getting a, you get a speeding ticket, you know. Some situation that follows that fight or flight response, you're going to get that release of uh, cortisol. And that, that type of stress our bodies are, are equipped to handle. The, the type of stress that we aren't so much equipped to handle is what we call chronic stress. And chronic stress would be stressors that pile up and stick around. So some examples, some examples would be a dysfunctional family or being trapped in an unhappy marriage or being very unhappy at your, at your job. You know, there's all kinds of chronic stress in our lives. And sometimes chronic stress gets ignored because it's old and familiar. So we get, we get used to it, and it just stays around all the time. So with that chronic stress, our body releases cortisol more frequently during the day. And then what happens is then that results in disturbed sleep. Because if we go back and we look at, oops, sorry, let me go back here for a second. If we go to this slide here, see our normal level would be that it's low by the time we go to bed. Well, if we're stressed all the time, we said that that can increase our cortisol, so that graph would definitely look a lot different. All right, let me get to the right slide here. So the result is chronically elevated blood sugar levels, um, decreased insulin sensitivity, and suppressed immune function. So in our fast-paced get-ahead get world, we, do, we have decided that we can run on less sleep. And unfortunately, our health is suffering due to chronic sleep deprivation. And Ralph Waldo Emerson said that health is the first to use and sleep is the condition to produce it. So let's talk about sleep a little bit. Uh, to get good sleep, uh, we've talked about stress. Um, your, dark, your room should be really dark with no light from anything. So if you have alarm clocks you know, and they're on your little TVs or your little your satellite box, your cable box, there's little lights. I always suggest to people to cover all of that up. Turn off your electronics at least a half an hour before going to bed. Ideally, that would be longer than that and keep your room in a cool temperature. The final piece of the insulin connection is exercise. And the CDC lists inactivity as the third leading cause of preventable death in the U.S. So that's, that's a pretty powerful statement. There's also a new term called uh, exercise couch potato, and I don't know if you've heard that term before. This is used to describe someone who sits at a desk all day, is on a computer, or watches TV at night that exercises about 30 minutes a day. So if you're sitting a lot, it is important to get up at least once an hour, five to ten minutes, and walk around. So why should we exercise? There's numerous benefits. Uh, stress relief and stress management is, is probably one of the, the primary um, benefits of exercise. And if we think back to our slide on cortisol and blood sugar, um, exercise plays a really big role in stress relief and stress management. <coughs> it helps with those hormones. And exercise also helps to move that blood sugar out of our cells out of our cells. If we go way back in the beginning of the presentation, we were talking about the blood sugar in our cells. One way to get maybe that out of our cells is through ex exercise. Um, <clears throat> exercise also helps build muscle, so we burn more calories at rest. So while we're sitting in a chair, we're burning more calories if we have more muscle. 
it increases our insulin sensitivity and increases the efficiency of our heart. So what kind of exercise? We're all told that we should move, right? So let's get up and move, but we're all time pressured as well. And so the best exercises combine strength, power, flexibility, and cardio all together. Um, interval training is a great form of exercise. Um, you know, <coughs> do intervals and circuit training and, you know, all of our devices now have intervals on there. You can just use a basic watch or a stopwatch and you can do those with so many forms of exercises. For example, if you like to walk, um, you could step it up a little bit and every few minutes, you know, jog for 30 seconds or walk a little bit faster and, and do those intervals. So think about ways that you can fit exercise into your life um, so that it isn't so, um, you know, some, some of us get uh, kind of bogged down with, oh, I can't exercise for an hour a day. But maybe you could break it up into 15-minute segments several times a day. That's just as effective. I always tell people that, uh, you know, if you can't make it to the gym or if you don't like the, the atmosphere of a gym, you can think of old school PE class, uh, things we used to do when we had PE every day in school. That's a conversation for another time, right? Uh, Push-ups, sit-ups, squats, chair dips, press, dog <coughs> jumps. And those exercises, no equipment is required, just, just your body. And a little goes a long way. So things like interval weight training, that's an effective way to build strength, muscle, power, cardiovascular fitness, as we talked about. Or you can combine those movements that we talked about on the previous page um, in an interval fashion to complete a workout in a short amount of time. <coughs> So to sum up everything that we've talked about today, insulin control is key to maintaining um, and improving your health. And really this equation of proper nutrition, quality sleep, kind of efficient exercise, all those things combined will really help to keep those insulin levels in their comfort zone. So um, this, this is the presentation part. Um, of the insulin connection, and I've left some time in case you had some initial questions about anything that we <coughs> talked about on here or anything related. All right, questions? Huh? I have two. Yes. One is Dr. Cornell's diagram is very useful to me for science mm -hmm. because I wondered why I could take off what you were at four o'clock. Mm -hmm. And not eat anything when I take it for breakfast, all of a sudden it's huge. Yes, no one has a that. And that's it. And the other is, I've been buying cashew cereal uh -huh. because it has protein in it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So my question is, when you get the cereal bars and the things that combine, is it better just to avoid those? Yeah. Um, yeah. You yeah. still need to carry stuff up. Yeah. Hey, Lisa, can you yes, hear her? I cannot. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one was the thank you for the, for the cortisol um, diagram. That was helpful. And it explained some of the rise and fall in blood sugar when you're testing your blood sugar throughout the day. The, the mm -hmm. people wake up and it's high and the liver is producing that blood sugar in the morning to get you to rise from a resting state <coughs> it should be a resting state. Right. But also the cortisol levels on the rise, so they, they go hand in hand. So that helped explain yeah. that to, um, to somebody on this end. The question that she's asking, and this is something that I would have probably elaborated on a little bit with your diagram, I do this same right. kind of presentation. And it has to do with the rise and fall of blood sugar as related to carbohydrate. Is not uh -huh. all carbohydrates are created equal. So the right. bagel would take it to the moon. Um, right. But a very complex 100% whole grain carbohydrate has the fiber and even some additional right. protein in it, like you said, for the combining effect. 
So the question is, you know, like for instance, Kashi cereal, it is one of those combining effects because <clears throat> it has the protein and the fiber and the carbohydrate, and so that slows down that push to get um, carbohydrate into the system. It gives it time to kind of level it off. So you don't get that Absolutely. sharp rise, you don't get that sharp fall. You don't need as much yes. insulin to process that because the protein is in it. Right. So, right. Um, so yours is a very good question. So the kashi bar is a good thing to carry with you, as are the nuts. And um, the cheese sticks don't have to be refrigerated like we would think. If you're going to keep them long term for a couple of days, yeah, the refrigerator. But you can certainly carry right. them, especially the laughing cow variety. Those do travel very well. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, I can keep laughing yeah. cow in my desk. That's, yeah, that's why, you know, I always tell people to look at that label and see what's in there. Um, yes, exactly. And, yeah, it's so important. And don't don't fall for what's on the front of the box. Turn it over and make sure you know what's in there. Because there are, you know, as, as we are getting uh, more educated, we can look at those labels. And there are products out there, you know, like those that, you know, do have that combination, which is great. They're portable and they don't have to be refrigerated, so excellent point. Mm -hmm. All right, now stand by, I got another comment coming in. Just one thing I okay. acknowledge for me is I have cereal in the morning, I usually have all the cheese sticks with it, or mm -hmm. a couple pieces of uh, bacon cheese, so mm -hmm. properly turkey bacon, but, mm -hmm. or a spoonful of um, uh, peanut butter. Mm -hmm. So, for the same reason. Right. So, someone else is reiterating the value of the combining and some medical advice that they got to do the same thing. Um, to add right. something. So, if you are going to have cereal in the morning, you can add things to that meal to help slow down that gush, as we call it. It's a, it's a gush of blood sugar. Yeah. Right. right. Good. And, you know, um, and on that exa example, I put cereal and skim milk, and we could we could start debating about fast and everything like that. But but just just talking about blood sugar, if that was at least if that was milk that had some fat in it, you know, think about those things. Because skim milk, you know, you're not getting any fat in that. Um, you are getting a little bit of protein, <clears throat> but you know, just you have to really just look at all those choices um, and. In my personal opinion, skim milk has no flavor. Um, I personally don't use skim milk. Um, it has no flavor to me. But even just moving up to something with 2% or, you know, if you are going to consume milk, um, a higher fat is going to help with that a little bit. So, again, always investigating those food labels to see what you're taking in. And, and a lot of the, the examples I put on here were, you know, absolute. So someone that something that is just a carbohydrate with no fat or protein in it. So check all those Very good. Check the labels. Very good. Sylvia, did you want to add anything? Miss Sylvia? No, ma'am. Okay. Just want to give you a chance to okay. pipe in. Any other questions or comments here on this side? We'll, we can debrief after we let Lisa go if you want to. No, but I agree with you, Austin, no. Two thumbs up on the skin. Though. Yes. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Bye. This was outstanding. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope you guys have a great day. Thanks, you. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you. Bye-bye.